I really like um, Amos or Young's treatment of um, the story of Zacchaeus. Uh, like the woman bent over for 18 years, so also the story of Zacchaeus is unique to the Gospel of Luke. And uh, um, not surprisingly, um, Young spends a lot of time with the Gospel of Luke, uh, not just for its uh, healings, but really, uh, more importantly, for its attention to the folks that Amos Young really wants to make sure get attention, which is the marginalized, the forgotten, the hated, the, um, the most likely to fall through the cracks. And he does a great job with Zacchaeus as this, uh, you know, uh, little person. Don't know how little. And maybe not technically what we call a little person, but small guy. Now, um, what I found weird there was that, uh, maybe not exceedingly weird, but, you know, Young points out, Jesus didn't change his height. And I kind of, well, what would we imagine in that case? An immediate miracle to, you know, turn Zacchaeus into a tall five foot eight guy. That would have been tall back then. Um, instead of the, you know, three point, three foot ten or whatever he was. Uh, you know, uh, growing immediately. Well, you know, shucks. Um I don't know what to say about that. So it's just weird to kind of go like, well, notice that Jesus didn't change Zacchaeus' physical condition. I guess he did change other people's physical condition, but that seems like that'd be quite a, <laughs> literally a stretch. I hadn't thought about that till just now. I hope you appreciate that mention in your notes. Um, now, I love what he says with the uh, Pentecost. I think that's really good stuff. Um, I, I, I'm not going to, zero in on it because I'm going to kind of stay with the uh, Satan theme here. Love what he has to say about um, Paul and the Corinthians and the idea that, that Paul communicates to these Corinthians who are very obsessed with strength and wisdom or their understanding, you know, knowledge and power. And, you know, we're all very gifted and wonderful people. And Paul really pulls the rug out from underneath them. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians primarily. Powerful, powerful letter in which he says it's the crucified Messiah, uh, Jesus the Messiah on a cross. Foolishness to the Greeks, to the Jews a stumbling block, but for us who believe it is the wisdom and the power of God. And like, you know, writing that in the first century Nobody's going to get immediately real excited about the idea that some guy that got uh, crucified on a Roman stake of execution somehow is the wisdom and the power and the glory of God. But that's, that's how Paul is sort of turning things upside down and uh, um, helping the Corinthians hopefully to recognize uh, those among them that they consider weak or unworthy or like a body part that would say to another part, we have no need of you. Remember, he talks about that uh, when he compares the church to a human body and says, you know, the eye cannot say to the hand or the hand cannot say to the little toe, we have no need of you. Uh, every part of the body has its place. Even those that we think of as perhaps a little embarrassing or whatever, and he doesn't really, I don't know what he has in mind. Um, I might, but I don't know for sure. So the main thing here is that, so Paul has this um, great theology. This has already had a big impact on me reading this chapter on the church as a uh, body of people they don't have to glory in their uh, struggles and weaknesses or, you know, sort of brag about them, but uh, that these are not discounted, that somehow they're not, they're not, not to think of themselves or be thought of as unworthy of, of the body of Christ. Now, um, he um, talks on page 86, he, uh, this is really interesting, as he tries to think about Paul as possibly disabled in some way. And it does seem likely that Paul had very poor eyesight. Perhaps he perhaps he was blind by the time he died. I, I don't know for sure. Uh, but, but it does appear that at least one of his problems was eyesight. 
but whether that's what he's talking about here, I don't know. But on page 86, we have uh, this, this really interesting passage. Uh, he's, he's talking about the fact that he had had some really powerful uh, spiritual experience, um, privileged with some kind of mystical experience is the language. It's all there in that first paragraph on 86. Uh, and then in the quotation there in the middle of 86, uh, Paul writes, uh, to keep me from being too elated or too proud or puffed up about my uh, heavenly visions or, um, you know, encounters, as it says, with the heavenly realm, a thorn was given me in the flesh. And most of us have heard of Paul's thorn in the flesh, or at least heard the phrase a thorn in the flesh. This is where it comes from. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. How interesting. In order to keep me from being too proud or, you know, self-congratulate, that word, self-congratulatory about his spiritual experiences, a thorn was given to him in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me to keep me from being too elated or too puffed up or too proud. Oh my goodness. Notice how, you know, this whatever, you know, messenger of Satan, which is the, the affliction itself, I guess, has a positive purpose. So um, we might go, well, that's not what Satan intended. Ah, I don't know that we can say that. If we think of the satanic figure, if we think about back there in Job, what we have is some kind of a, uh, we'll say, spiritual being who's acting under divine authority. So much so that, again, at the end of Job, God doesn't even have to bother to explain that Satan was part of the deal. Just says, hey, look, what do you know? What do you know, Job, about the mysteries of the world? So here... Uh, Paul receives this thorn in the flesh, uh, whatever it might be. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions. But that first word, weaknesses, is the one that's most important to uh, Amos Young. And again, here, uh, now I noticed that across the page, uh, right across the page on 87, Young wrote, uh, further, as consistent with the first century worldview, this physical malady, whatever it was, was considered to have been a satanic scourge. The early Christian mind had probably learned the lessons, lesson of Job by this time, that any impairment from God may have been mediated through the satan. The felt torment was in any case associated with the onslaught now he says the onslaught of evil spirits. That's actually more than what Paul says. Paul simply says a messenger of Satan to torment me, but really this torment is to keep me like humble and in my place and not thinking too highly of myself. So interestingly enough, uh, a positive.